Thanks for having me. My name is Spencer Lyon. I'm here to talk about plotlyjs.jl. Uh, so I'd like, first of all, I'd like to thank Jack and the Plotly team for inviting me to come out. Uh, and then, funny, why is there a Julia guy in the middle of our day here? I was talking to Jason Grout the other day, and we identified me as the obligatory Julia guy that infests any Python or R conference. So here I am. Thanks for having me. Hopefully I uh, say some things that are interesting. Uh, Okay, so everything's live today. Fingers crossed that it works out. The rough outline of what we're gonna do, say 30 seconds about me, talk about Julia for a minute so we have some context of what code looks like and uh, some of a unique feature of Julia. And then I'll go through how Plotly works with Julia and how you can construct Plotly visualizations in Julia. So a little about me, I'm a fourth year economics PhD student at NYU. Uh, I live here in New York with my wife and our three kids. I'm active in the Julia community. I occasionally make sightings in the Python world. Uh, and my research interests are broadly defined uh, or contained within concepts about information or international macro or risk sharing or even asset pricing. Um, and they all have some computational slant to whatever I end up working on. Okay, so what is Julia? From the Julia main page, if you go to julialang.org, you'll read, Julia is a high-level, high-performance, dynamic programming language for technical computing, with syntax familiar to users of other technical computing environments. Just so I can gauge the audience a little bit, who's used Julia before? Okay. Excellent. Um, <laughs> I'm hopefully going to explain a little bit why, what's unique or interesting about Julia and maybe pique your interest a little bit. So for me, why do I like it? First of all, it's fast. Uh, and I'm talking fast both in terms of my time as a developer uh, as well as the runtime. When I run the code, it compiles to efficient native code. And when I'm doing large-scale economic models and simulations, runtime becomes an issue. Uh, instead of running something for, say, two to three weeks, I can run that in six or seven hours, which is a big deal. Um, and second main reason is I just think it's fun. There's some neat concepts that are pretty liberating as a programmer. Uh, so the core concept behind Julia, what's this all about? Uh, it's a concept called multiple dispatch. Um, and what this means is that the functions that are run when you call a function, the, the one that's actually executed is going to depend on the type of each argument. In typical object-oriented languages like Python, you're going to see specialization based on the first argument of the function. So you're going to write a class, and I write a method there. There's this magic first argument, typically named self in Python, and that's going to kind of dictate what's get called when I do object.method and call the function. In Julia, instead of restricting the dispatch to that first argument, it works across all arguments. And the easiest way to understand the concept is just to see an example. <clears throat> so I have for you here a very simple example. So I'm going to define a function f takes two arguments and it returns the string two arguments and tells me what they are. So I define f, I call it with hello and this tropical fish and sure enough I get the string back, two arguments, hello and tropical fish. So now if we move on, I'm going to define another method for the function f and this time I'm going to say if the first argument happens to be a number Instead, I'd like you to return the string, the first argument is a number, tell me what it is, and the second's not, just tell me what that is. If I define this method, I can still call the old method. If I pass hello and tropical fish, these are two strings, so the previous method that's kind of a fallback where I didn't restrict the type, that's still going to be called. However, if the first argument happens to be a number, then this new method I've just defined here on this slide gets run. Uh, and just this is showing you, I passed the integer 2. I could also pass a floating point number. And this is showing that not only are these methods able to dispatch on multiple parameters, but they're also fully generic, uh, which is a big deal when you're writing numerical code. Um, next, I could define functions using a slightly different syntax. But here, instead of only restricting the type of the first argument like we did before, I'm also going to say that the second argument, y, needs to be a number in order for this method to be called. Uh, so now if I call this function and I pass two numbers, this most recent function definition is called, and the other ones are still intact and in place, and if I were to pass a string or any other data type, it would fall back to one of the more generic methods we saw previously. 
So what's, what's the point of all this? First, the function f is not very useful. <laughs> the only reason I show it is because it, it explains the concept of using the types of more than one argument in order to direct which function gets called or what functionality happens when you call a function. And I'm going to leverage this inside the plotly.js library or js.jl library in order to make the API convenient and natural feeling for a Julia user. Uh, they're going to call one function named maybe plot. And depending on the types of arguments they pass to that, I can then pick exactly what behavior should happen. Uh, and we'll see examples of that later on. So that's a little bit about Julia. Now I'm moving on to talking about the package that I wrote for working with Plotly. Uh, Plotly.js.jl, it's a Julia wrapper for Plotly.js. First of all, it creates Plotly plots. Uh, and second, it exposes all the API functions you find in the Plotly JavaScript library to pure Julia. So if you're familiar with the JavaScript library, uh, all the functions that you see there that you can use to manipulate plots or update them on the fly, those are available in Julia, and we'll see examples of that. Uh, I had two main goals when I set out to make this library. First, I wanted to make it convenient to construct and manipulate any Plotly visualization within Julia. And second, I wanted to provide an infrastructure for viewing the plots on multiple front ends. Uh, by that, I might mean the Jupyter Notebook. I might mean a standalone window. I might mean inside of your text editor or inside the Interact Notebook. Uh, so I want to be able to view this in a wide range of front ends and also save publication quality vector images to disk so that I can put them in my papers that I write. Um, so let's go over how does it work. I'm going to over give a brief overview of the API. It's kind of split into two layers. First layer is completely faithful to the Plotly JavaScript API. Uh, the function or the, the object is going to be named the same thing, take the same attributes. And what this does is it unlocks the door for any user of this library to do absolutely anything Plotly.js can do. Because we map one-to-one -to, -one to their API, we have the same functionality you would have if you were using the raw JavaScript library. Uh, and the second part is a, a, a layer on top of that that makes it a bit more convenient or natural uh, for a, a Julia programmer to build these plots. So first, in order to understand how this works, we need to see how does plotly.js, the JavaScript library, uh, represent a plot. So it's just a JSON object that has two main keys. Uh, first, you have a layout. And this describes, sorry, overall features of the plot, things like titles or fonts or the x-axis or the range on the y-axis. Uh, that's going to go into the layout. And then the second object, or the second part of this JSON object is associated with the data. And this is going to be an array of data that describes what's actually seen when you're plotting. So if you were to plot a bar chart, you would have one of the elements of this data array would be to describe what the bar looks like. Um, and we're going to call this what's inside the data. It's going to be an array of traces. Uh, this is all the terminology that the Plotly.js team came up with. So if this is how I would do it, using raw JavaScript, I want to see how could I do the same thing in Julia. So the goal is to generate JSON. And naturally, JSON is in Julia can be represented as a dictionary or a dict. Uh, if I were to build this with raw Julia, this is what I'd have to do. I'd have to specify I need a dict to store this layout and the data. Within that, the layout is itself a dict that says things like the title. Uh, the data maps to an array that has dicks in it that, des that describe different traces in the plot. Um, this is not that convenient uh, for a few reasons that I didn't like this too much. Uh, one, I don't like having to write out dict every time I'm doing something. I'm just lazy. Uh, second, I have to add a bunch of quotes on either side. There's a way to get around that, and I'd like to do that. And then I don't really like drawing these little equal sign greater than arrows. So these are three of the things that annoyed me when I first started this project, and I wanted to try to alleviate that. Today, if you were to use this library, you could construct the plot that we talked about, or that I showed you before, using just this syntax. Uh, we're going to construct a scatter trace. We can set the y attribute there. We can set that the marker symbols are going to be squares. And then we can have the layout give us a title on our plot. And we're going to walk through what these pieces mean pretty soon. But We've gone from this dict of dicks to something a bit more readable and easy to work with. 
So the two main things we're building when we're trying to construct a plotly visualization are we need to build traces, maybe one or more of them, and we need to build a layout. So let's talk about how we build each of those things. So like we just saw, the trace before uh, could be built like this. Uh, and then I want to point out one thing about the syntax here. Notice that there's an underscore here between marker and symbol. So I have marker underscore symbol. And what, what actually happens here is this creates like a nested JSON attribute. So it's going to have a top level field marker. That itself is going to be a JSON object that has symbol mapping to square. Uh, and to see this really clearly, let's just print out the JSON that's generated uh, when I run that. Uh, and notice here that inside this object for our trace, we have marker. It's an object that has symbol mapping to square. Uh, so now we've used underscores here as kind of like a, a mini DSL in some sense to avoid the need to create nested dictionaries. Um, here's a few more examples of how we can create other traces. Uh, I'll point out here, notice that we have marker underscore line underscore width. This is going to take that same underscore magic we just saw and nest at multiple levels. So marker is going to contain one key that has line, which is itself another dictionary. With inside of it has width that maps to two. Uh, and to be really clear about that, we can expect the JSON that was generated. And we see that marker itself is an object. Uh, that has line is another object, and finally width maps to two. Um, and then it also is smart enough, it didn't overwrite the marker color attribute. So we also still get a top level color mapping straight to red inside of our marker. It didn't, it's smart about doing a recursive merge, so it doesn't overwrite if you do <coughs> different levels of nesting when you're constructing these. Uh, so all traces, so we saw here that I, I built a scatter trace here, another one I built a contour, another one I would build a bar trace. Uh, all the traces in Plotly.js have a corresponding Julia function. If you want to build a histogram, there's the histogram function. If you want to build uh, a surface chart, there's a surface function. Uh, and what this allows you to do is you can go to the Plotly.js chart attribute reference uh, to get like a really sometimes overwhelming list of everything that's possible. <laughs> so anything that's possible in plotly.js, you can get to and you can use in this library too. Uh, and just to get some idea of how much is there, the scroll bar is like barely even moved. There's a lot here. Um, OK. So I told you we had to build one or more traces, but we also need to build a layout. How do we do that? Well, here we're just going to use the layout function. Uh, and notice there's one new thing to point out here. I'm still doing this underscore magic. So this is going to make y-axis become an object, and title is going to map to consumption. Uh, but I have something here. x-axis is now one of these. I'm using this attr function, or attr. And what this does is it creates a group of nested objects. So what happens is x-axis is going to be a dictionary or a JavaScript object or a JSON object that has two keys in it now instead of just one. Uh, an alternative would be, would be me writing x-axis underscore range, x-axis underscore title. Uh, but if you were going to set a lot of things on the x-axis, it's easier just to group them all together. Uh, and we can see that it did this by taking a look at the, uh, the JSON that it generated for us. And we see here that the x-axis does have these two keys, uh, so they're nicely grouped. I think we've come a long way in just these few little tricks uh, of avoiding some of the pain of building nested dictionaries in Julia. It's not, we've alleviated a lot of that, that pain now. Once we've built one or more traces and a layout, if we actually want to display that or create a plotly chart, we just pass them to the plot function. We say plot, we give it a trace and a layout is going to display that trace uh, and then apply whatever we said to that layout. Uh, we can do this for the other trace. The layout's optional. If we didn't have anything to say, we don't need to put it. Uh, and then we can also have more than one trace in our chart if we'd like. So here we're going to display that bar we created earlier as well as this line chart. Um, so that covers like the faithful plotly.js API. 
anything that you can look up on that reference page uh, is possible in Julia, and that's how you do it. And now we're going to talk a little bit about what, how we can make things slightly more convenient in Julia. So one way we could do is we could say, what are all the methods that you know about the plot function? We can ask Julia that. And what it'll do is it'll give us a list of all the different methods we have. Uh, and forget these ugly type names. The point is, if the first argument happens to be an array, a one-dimensional array, and the second argument happens to be a two-dimensional array, that says to do one thing. And I've isolated what the user should get out if they've passed me these type of arguments. Uh, if they give me two matrices, what do I do, and so on. Uh, and there's lots of different combinations of things the user can pass me, all mapped to one clear uh, result. So let's just see how they work. Here's the classic, if we just have some x and y data and we want to make a line chart, we just say plot x, y, uh, and it will construct that for us. Another one is if we do the same keyword arguments, we can change features of the, the plot that's made. So here we can set the marker color and we can change this scatter trace to be displayed as markers instead of a line. Uh, we could also, if we wanted, pass, create more than one trace. And the way this works is this syntax in Julia it takes two vectors and stacks them as a matrix. So similar if you've ever used MATLAB, this is a similar syntax. So here, if we see a matrix, then we're going to create more than one trace, one for each column. Uh, and this would feel very natural to a Julia programmer. Uh, this is how a lot of computations are organized. If you want, you could pass a layout, and you can put titles on the overall plot and on the axes. And also, you could pass functions, if you'd like, and plot those. And you can get arbitrarily complex. Uh, here I've passed a list of functions, so that's created one trace per function, and we're seeing that here. If I wanted to turn this into a bar chart, it's as easy as saying the kind of chart I want is a bar. Um, okay, so another thing, again, the first part of my goal when I started the project was to make things convenient for a Julia user. Uh, another thing was creating subplots. I want one chart that has multiple plots in it. Uh, and a declarative API like, like Plotly's can be somewhat difficult to do subplots. You have to specify a lot of things, like where do the axes go, which axes lines up with the other, what data gets plotted on that axis. And that can be a lot to manage, and it can become very verbose pretty quickly. Uh, so what I've done is if, suppose that you have multiple plots that you've constructed, say P1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, I'm going to kind of overload the Julia notation for building up matrices to build up matrices of plots. So for example, here's a quick function, rand plot. It takes an integer, and it just constructs a scatter chart where you have x, and x data goes from 1 to that integer, and the y is just a bunch of random normal variables. Uh, and then I'm going to build four plots. I'm going to call them P1, 2, 3, and 4. They're going to have 10, 20, 30, and 40 elements to them. So now if I wanted to create one figure with two subplots, and I wanted it to have one row and two columns, I would just put these plots in a matrix such that the output in Julia would be a one row, two column matrix. And then it would make the subplot for me. Um, if I wanted three columns, I would just put a third plot there. Um, I can do rows instead of columns, or I could even do rows and columns and make a matrix. Um, and so here we're going to see I've created this as the first row. This would be the second row of my plot. And now I have this subplot, or sorry, this matrix of subplots. And just to give a sense of kind of what, what we were saved from here, I'm going to print out the JSON for that last plot, the two by two grid of subplots. And we'll see here that the layout object, that I didn't pass a layout at all. I just stuck together two plots, each containing one scatter. The layout itself is pretty long. Uh, and then each of the traces has a bunch of extra information. So a lot of this nitty gritty work of specifying where the axes are, what they line up with, how they're paired together, and where the data go is automated for you, which is nice. Um, another thing that's really fun is that we can call any of the Plotly.js API functions. So one of them is called restyle. 
And this function lets you, after you've shown a plot, after you've created one, it lets you change specific attributes of one or more traces. So here on this plot that we're displaying right here, I'm going to change the, the marker colors to be forest green. So if I run this code, uh, the plot updates, and it's forest green. If I wanted to add a title, that's adjusting the layout because that's where the title goes. So I'm going to call the relayout function, and I'm going to add a title. Uh, I could even add another trace onto my plot if I wanted to bring back one of the traces we created earlier. Uh, the prepend traces function is going to add additional points to the beginning of the green line. So when I do that, it's going to add a few points uh, that we just saw show up over here. And then I can, if I didn't, if I realize I don't really like that red trace, I can uh, just delete it. And you can imagine that these are kind of the primitives, but upon which you can build arbitrarily complex interactive plots. Um, and I'll show you now, we could also leverage IPython widgets here in the, 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 the notebook. And we can create little mini applications. So here, I'm just going to be plotting the sine function. Uh, but I'm going to change the phase and the frequency. And I can also change things like the marker color if I'm plotting lines or dots. Here, let's, let's change things around and make the plots dance a little bit. Um, so this is pretty fun. This is all, all that's happening here is I'm calling restyle one time. Every time one of these widgets changes, it gets the current state and it calls restyle to update the data, update the information that's being plotted. Um, so I'm going to skip that one. OK, so that was goal number one, make it easy to build and manipulate plotly visualizations from Julia. Uh, goal two was to have a rich display output on multiple front ends. Uh, and one of them, this kind of a core feature of the library, is that we can display in our own dedicated Electron application. So I don't know if you've heard of Electron, but it's a product that GitHub put out that kind of wraps the Chromium web browser from Google and makes it applicable to create desktop applications. So things like the Atom text editor or the Slack app or Interact Notebook are Electron applications. Here, the plotlyjs.jl library has their own custom Electron app for displaying plotly charts. Um, and so this is, is cool because it gives me like a dedicated GUI window that I have full control over when I display my charts. But it also allows me to have two-way communication between Julia and JavaScript. And this means I can, from Julia, initiate some function or routine to be called in JavaScript, and they can get the results sent back to me. Um, so I'm just going to show you a quick demo of what that looks like. So if I open up, I fire up my Julia console, and I load the library here, I'm just going to build uh, a chart. It's going to have a chart with five random walks. Uh, that's what we've generated here. And I can start to do stuff like if I wanted to change the first, third, and fifth trace on this plot to be marker be dots instead of a line. I could easily do that. Um, I, could, I could change the names. Here they're named the generic trace 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I could name them random walk 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, and really, all the same features we saw available in the notebook are available here, either when you're working directly at the REPL or if you have a Julia script or file that's running. Suppose you're running some algorithm, you can have the plot automatically display what's going on inside the algorithm as it's running. Um, and also, from here, if I wanted to, I could save this figure to a PDF. So here, I'm just going to save it to a PDF on my desktop. Uh, and if I open that up, here we get the same figure. And notice it's total publication quality vector image, uh, which, is, which is quite nice. Um, We've seen here that it works inside the, the Jupyter Notebook, or the, what we're going to call the iJulia package. Here, we're going to have the same interactivity that we saw at the REPL, but it's all happening right inside of your notebook. Uh, and then we've already seen how we can leverage like IPython widgets to put controls and sliders and drop downs and boxes to manipulate our chart. Um, cool. Uh, another project inside the Julia world is the IDE effort that's going on is built inside of the Atom text editor. So like I said before, Atom is just Electron. 
And I've shown you that we have a bunch of cool interactive stuff inside of Electron. So all the same things that were possible at the REPL are possible inside of your text editor. So if I just r run this code and then, so I just ran this whole file. And if I run one of these functions, it's going to go ahead and pull up a chart for me right here in my editor uh, that contains whatever I was doing. And here's a cool example um, of an animation happening inside my editor. So what's happening here, uh, yeah, I'll take a minute to talk about it. This is some cool economics here. <laughs> Um, so what's happening is each point on the graph is a potential equilibrium in a model with agents having different beliefs. Uh, along the x horizontal axis is some parameter that I can govern as the economist. The points that are being plotted on the y axis are potential equilibrium steady states or where the economy might end up. Notice here that for low values of x, there's only one place the economy can go. There's not multiple y values at a particular x, but as we vary this parameter, things can get kind of crazy. For a little while, there's two possible places. The economy could go somewhere high or somewhere low. Uh, but as x gets sufficiently big, the behavior becomes quite chaotic. Um, and this, yeah, this is known as a, a bifurcation diagram or di bifurcation plot. OK, and then finally, we can also leverage the iJulia support to have these plots display inside the Interact notebook because the underlying technology for both of them is just the Jupyter kernel. So if I open up the presentation I've been talking about inside of Interact, uh, we can see, once it loads up, um, that all the charts we've been looking at inside of Jupyter are still here inside Internet, Interact. Um, so this is pretty cool that we're able to leverage the rich multimedia displays of a bunch of different technologies. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is a, new, a relatively new feature I added that is how you can apply styles to your plots. And the way you think about style is a set of default arguments, either for the layout or for a trace of a particular type or for any trace, regardless of what type it is. And just to give you a sense of how it works, I have like a, a ggplot style that makes these things look, makes any plotly chart look a little more like ggplot. Uh, and here's another simple function that creates a plot. So if I activate the ggplot style and create a plot, now I get the color scheme that looks a bit more like ggplot as well as the fonts. Um, and then there's a few more that were built in. There's a, a Seaborn one for Python users. There's a one that looks like the 538 blog. There's another one that I like to load up when I'm working in my editor that matches the syntax highlighting scheme I have in my text editor. Uh, and then, yeah, there's lots of uh, functionality you can get by using these styles. And so I think that's about all I had to, uh, to share today. And there's time, yeah. You mentioned that Julia really excels in speed performance. Yeah. Um, what's like what sort of metrics are you talking? Like how much speed up are you talking about versus? So if you Python look, R, these are benchmarks, so they're a little biased. But if you look at the Julia website, um, it'll give you a picture of, of kind of what we're talking about here. So all these speeds, these magnitudes, are relative to C code. So you're seeing here Julia on all these different benchmarks is within a factor of two. Uh, of C. If you look here at things like Python, you jump up into double figures, 77 R in some of these, which again, this is not idiomatic, the fastest thing you can do it in R. This is writing the exact same algorithm in every language to test how do loops work, how do conditionals inside a loop, stuff like that. Uh, but if you just kind of look across the board, Julia is on par with C and Fortran in most of these, these benchmarks. Um, really, really great work. This is super, super impressive. Um, wondering how the, uh, the Julia community has responded to this package, if people are adopting it. And yeah. Then, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So there's been a lot of effort in the Julia community around a package called plots.jl. 
And what this does is it doesn't actually do any plotting by itself, but it provides like an abstraction layer over all the Julia plotting libraries. So you'll see things like the PyPlot package or Gadfly or plotlyjs.jl um, are all accessed a lot of the times through this package. But I also actually have gotten quite a bit of feedback specific to just using plotlyjs by itself. Uh, so I'd say it's fairly well received. It's kind of hard to gauge because the user base of Julia is not near what it is for R or Python. Uh, but among the users who I do know about, a lot of them use this for their plotting day to day. And the second part of the question is, uh, are there any particular features in Plotly.js library that, um, that you're looking for, or that the Julia community is looking for in scientific visualization? Um, there's one issue. I think it's actually already been resolved. Uh, the way Julia serializes their date time object to strings or to JSON was inconsistent with how Plotly.js accepted it. But I've talked to people here, and they've already resolved that issue. So. I think that's it. And then I can't think of any of the top of my head from like the broader Julia community. Like we'd like to see this type of chart or this functionality available. I think it's pretty well covered. Okay, thanks. Oh, one more over here. <laughs> uh, yeah, so sorry for the uh, advertising here, but I actually work on a project called Quant Econ. Uh, and we have a set of lectures geared towards like advanced undergrads all the way up through like current researchers or practitioners in economics that want to learn more programming. And specifically, we teach the basics starting from ground zero of Python and Julia. And there's a whole series of you know, seven or eight lectures. This is the very beginnings of Julia, not specific to economics at all. And then we'll jump in with you know, 30 or 40 so applications of uh, this. So a lot of times, even when I talk to like, the core Julia team, they direct people here a lot of the time. So sorry for the self-advertising, but I think this is a fairly good resource. OK, thank you now. Yeah.